All right. So it's been six months. Time for me to come up and talk about SSL again. Not, I personally have not done all that much in the last six months on SSL, but other folks have. Uh, so one of the things that have happened is Persia has worked on doing some SSL ticket key block simplifications. As we've been talk, talked about this over a number of summits. The original uh, ticket key block definitions that were created by LinkedIn, which are great, but are specified in the SSL multi-cert file, which is really more resolution than most people need for most implementations, just having one ticket key block file that potentially defines a series of tickets is sufficient for all domains. And it's easier to just specify that one file in records.config. And so that's what Persia did to uh, bugs there. And she also added a global enable. I think the enable disabling completely was kind of, and probably still is kind of broken in the SSL multi-cert file. So we have a global, it works. Yes, and it's memory safe. Did the uh, memory leak fix it? Yeah, it's, it's Get it cherry back yeah. into uh, 7 we'll, Yeah. We'll double check. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there's the APIs. Um, yeah. Uh, two new entries in uh, records.config. So very simple, and uh, we'll make ticket use much easier. A, a less, it wasn't all that much code, but if you go and look at the comments on that bug, Igor, what are you doing? Do you have your phone? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it wasn't me. Was it you, Igor? Okay. <laughs> so if you look at this bug, there is a very long conversation about SNI and server session reuse. So we like to reuse connections to the server. It makes things more efficient particularly if we're doing SSL. SSL handshake's expensive. We want to reuse that connection as much as possible. And uh, I know at Yahoo anyway, we run with session sharing match both, which means it has to match both the IP and the FQDN of the server. So, and so in pre 70 that's what it would do. However, uh, it didn't really consider the SNI names. Uh, and I think this is primarily an issue with pristine hosts. But, uh, and uh, newer versions of Apache now are a little bit more restrictive about that. So to explain it, let's look at an example. So consider those remaps. We are remapping from example to origin example and dub 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 example to origin example. So they're both going to origin example. Yay. We have pristine headers enabled. All right, and ATS is going to use the host field of the server request to uh, set the SNI for the origin connection. This was added at about 5.1. Uh, so that's why Jared noticed it as he was moving up. He hadn't noticed it before. So we have a client, and he uh, client makes a request to example.com slash Bob. So it makes a new connection, gets the data, it's great. And uh, ATS negotiates a connection to or origin example with an SNI name of example.com, because we have pristine headers, right? So then the client makes a request to www.example.com slash Dave. All right, so in our original code, we would reuse the existing connection to origin example. It's the same IP address, it's the same uh, fully qualified domain name. But Apache, uh, the newer Apache HP would get very mad because it says you have a host header for www.example.com, but you negotiated this connection with the SNI name of example.com. You're, you're trying to, you know, do something bad. Does, does it care if the SNI name matches, or does it prefer that it's still in the valid direction? It's looking at the SNI name. I mean, I assume it also is, is verifying that the cert's valid. Well, because um, this is actually very clear for the uh, Is that right? Right. <laughs> yeah, I I believe that the cert is valid for both, and and but it's the SNI name. So yeah, bummer. Uh, 
So for us, for we, we don't care, but a lot of cases, and particularly for proxies, if you have patchy origins that are 2.4, then that's a bad thing. So there was much debating and discussing about things. And uh, Jared came up with a fix, which we eventually uh, dealt, did put on. So in addition to touching the port and the server, we also check if there's an SNI set that also has to match. We, in that previous case, we would not reuse the connection because the SNI that of the request uh, does not match the SNI that that connection was negotiated with. Uh, I so did. Is that, both, is that the does both now do all the three or both does all three? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> just to so all. all it should be <laughs> all. Yeah. Uh, I did file a bug. We may eventually want to have a lax mode for origins that don't care. Which is the same as having the all, right? Yeah, maybe we'd have a both <coughs> and all, and it'd just be like <laughs> two of three. It took yeah. so long to figure out what was actually going on. <laughs> Lax wouldn't be both. Lax would be like one or. Lax would be the old behavior, so I don't care about the SNI. Uh, but I haven't, uh, hasn't been an issue. We haven't passed on That is in 7.0. Uh, I would assume for most folks that's not going to make a huge difference. Uh, it's a pretty constrained example to make that happen. Uh, although, obviously, for Jared's case, that was happening for him. Yeah, they're being secure. I respect that as long as it's be good, good enough. Is only support HTTP? Ah, uh, do they? In HTTP? So I wonder how that works. I wonder if they don't support that part. Yeah, and it was, it was, I was trying to look through uh, putting these slides together, the, the docs on this, to see exactly what's happening there. And I found kind of opaque references, but it's possible that there's settings that you can perk, pork up to say I am being really anal, and perhaps the service he was hitting. But only because if, if they do, if they are okay with any name, then instead of just well, here's the name that said we're okay. Mm. Oh, child. Exactly. <laughs> um, just, just you know, yeah. That's, that's that's what you do in CD or HD. Mm -hmm. That's what clients do. That's what you have to do. Yeah. Let's try it not. does mean that you can do more reuse. Right. It is more right. than what, you know. Right, if you're doing, yeah. So, I mean, you could just do an IP, if, yeah, you could just do the IP check. But yes, I suppose you could also do a. Is this, is this an SIA in the list of valid domain? A, 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 yeah. A, a host set check. Yes, I don't know how. Yep. Yeah, so that it was a fairly basic fix, but yeah, it took discussions over several months to figure out what was going on. Uh, all right, um, something that hasn't happened, but I guess we've started talking about again, is revision, revisiting the idea of having a session ID hook. So kind of in the uh, area of tickets, right? So there's two ways of doing session reuse. One is the ticket system, where basically the client is storing the state, and the server just has to have a key to decrypt the session and resume the session that way. Uh, and the uh, kind of original way is the session ID. So the client gives a session ID. It's the server's responsibility to store the session state. And given the ID, picks up the session state, goes again. Now, if you just have one box running, we have an implementation. It's great. Um, uh, you can use the core OpenSSL, or you can use the one that's implemented in ATS, which performs better, which I think was done by LinkedIn as well, right? Yeah, you know. Brian did that. If you have more than one box that's operating in a cluster, though, that doesn't really work. Tickets works easily enough. You just have to copy your ticket key around. That's easy enough. But in the session ID case, you have, say, 10 ATS boxes, and you have a load balancer in front that's spreading traffic over them. And the client you know, negotiates with the first box and then tries to resume that session ID on the second box. Unless those two boxes are communicating, he's not going to be able to resume on the second box. So if you have any sizable cluster, that means the session ID reuse is pretty useless. Now, time has moved on, and a lot of people have accepted tickets. So I was hopeful earlier, looking at our monitoring, saying maybe no one's using session IDs anymore, and we can just not worry about it. We can simply we can remove our current scheme. We have we have a scheme which is kind of heavyweight, 
we can remove our scheme and just do the ticket thing. Unfortunately, when I looked at our monitoring reports, we were seeing still 40 to 50% of our SL TLS reuse being the session ID source. Yes? You know, with your new software load balancer, I think that would mean that the request always lands at the same server. Um, that, that's what no, because no, 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 ports. Your IP address change? No, because the ports, the source port will change. So, so you could enable SSL sticky, but, but we don't uh, get good coverage on that, right? Yeah, it's uh, the, it, it's heavy on the load balancer, so we try to turn it off. That's why we we chose this path. Yeah, yeah. In our new scheme, I guess we could do that experiment again. But, uh, so, like, we have a thing that hash based off of whatever you pick. And you don't include the source port. And then that way we... Yeah. Yeah, Scott? Did you try uh, turning off session ID to see if they switched the tickets? Or? You know, no, I didn't do that. You know, I was just looking at Yama's this okay. kind of casual, like, do we really have to do this? Because if it just said, no, you don't, I would be happy and, and not. Is there a preference? You know, if you're <laughs> no, no, from the ATS perspective, it's all, it's all driven by the client. Uh, if the client says that they can do tickets, I believe you do tickets. Double check that. Yeah, I guess it would be good to verify that we prefer that. Well, I don't see how we could not prefer that if we do it at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so the client in there, hello, will have a TLS extension saying, hey, I can do tickets. Um, doesn't mean they will, though. No, doesn't mean they will. Yeah, I can do tickets. Here's my question. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Yeah. I guess if they do both, uh, then we probably, I don't know what we do. Probably would do the same. Um, I don't know. Have, have other, so do, have other people seen their track their session ID reuse percentages? Is that similar to what other folks are seeing? I think a big how you, issue. How did you find that? What, is there a response for that? I'm... No, uh, I was looking at our monitoring logs. I, on individual, I mean, we must be pulling it. That it kind of accumulates our our individual stats. So I assume it's in the stat lands. Are you asking what the ultimate source of that information is? Um, well, I don't even know how to go about looking for that data. Yeah, to see. I think it's either Francois or um, Eric. There are stats. Yeah. About that. Maybe from yeah, but I think the stats are pulled from our session reuse process, not the actual, well, yeah, not we, we override, yeah. the, the open source has uh, has one as well. Yeah, there's one in the open source, and we get that in the logs. Yeah. So. But I, from what Dave Thompson was saying, uh, was it uh, Safari and the Apple products don't use tickets? Uh, so that's speculate, and we speculate that's where a good big percentage of that is. Apple people. <laughs> So um, a while back, a couple years year back, um, I proposed an API. Uh, if we had hooks in ATS processing of the session IDs, that would be an opportunity to put in some communication. We had a communication scheme then. When a new ticket showed up, you could send the information or you're going to communicate. And the particular communication scheme would be very organizational specific. We all set our things up slightly differently. Um, so I uh, had made a, a proof of concept uh, branch and uh, some docs and put that up and I got some pushback and then the next fire came up and didn't get back to it. Uh, because our existing scheme was working well enough. Our existing scheme is not working so great now, so I, I hope we'll get back to that uh, this quarter. All right, another thing that comes up every six months is SSL negotiation refinement, or Alan calls early intervention? Yes. Early intervention. So there are a lot of uh, use cases for making finer grain decisions about what kind of attributes that are going to be available during your SSL session negotiation. So you know how much certificate verification you're willing to do, what protocols we want to accept. So like HTTP, do we want to offer HTTP two or not? What kind of ciphers do we want to offer during the negotiation? And uh, technically, right, after the client says hello, there are hooks, we can go and kind of adjust all of that, and that works out just fine. Uh, but it's kind of an issue of, of messiness, right? And there are questions, I guess, if we could do some of this via static configuration, but we just restrict ourselves to plugins. Um, 
and it's still kind of messy. So something that happened to us in the last month or two, when did you do this? About six weeks back, I think. Yeah. Was uh, we had a customer, one of our, our properties said, we can't do HTTP2. It doesn't work. Don't. Because of the Apple. Yes. Because of a company Apple. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so we, we didn't want to turn off HTTP2 for everyone. HTTP2 is very good. So uh, Alan wrote a plugin, and uh, it hooked on the SNL as a cert callback to adjust the NPN or ALPN, uh, the NPN list, uh, whatever it is underneath the covers for that particular domain. There was a remap. I, we're activating via remap, I think. Yeah, so we look at the SNI name and then um, tweak the NPN list. Right. So, uh, so it works. That's great. But it's hacky, right? Uh, so ideally, you'd like to say, you know, whatever, you, whatever the default is, we just want to take HV2 out of it. And whatever else was there is fine. But we can't do that easily. So instead, what it does, it says, OK, here, here is the string that we have. Uh, just jam it in there. Yeah, it gets uglier, because in order to jam the list, then you actually have to have the subcontinuations that follow along from those strings. Right, so for each NPN name, mm -hmm. there is also a um, continuation that says, well, if they give you this name, here's a continuation you use to keep going with the connection. Do the, okay, do the so you're making up new continuations for that? Yes. Oh, that's exciting. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so what we ended up doing was we, we take a, a string that's really the same as a proxy port config string. We pass it something that processes that in the same way a proxy port does, and that creates a continuation for us. All right, so we're kind of creating new continuations on the fly instead of just using the ones that were created at the beginning yeah, of the time? Yeah, but it's not really on the fly because we can do this at, at plug-in initialization mm -hmm. time. Okay. But anyway, as you can imagine, we did this because we were in a really hurry and we wanted to explore some stuff. But as you can imagine, we're not real happy with the quality of the code that resulted right. from all of this. So so we're not going to submit it to open source because it's gone. Yes, it'd be much nicer if we could get our hands on the server port object, which has the NPN, NPN list and all those continuations. Make a copy of that and then remove what we want or have an API to manipulate from that. And the, the server port object contains a bunch of other interesting things that might be nice to manipulate. Or to even look at as you're as you're going through and, and making decisions here. Yeah. So anyway, it came up again. So eventually we'll solve that. Is it not easier to do or like a Configuration override kind of thing, or make this. Well, it's, it's more of an issue of getting our hands on a data structure, a global data structure. So just the way things are implemented right now, uh, when you set up a server port, uh, uh, you know, in, in records.config, you know, server port 443, SSL, blah blah blah. I know, does the NPN list is you can override at that point, right? Yes. But there's a default list. I mean, I don't think hardly anyone overrides there. Yeah. But there's uh, an SSL callback that does the selection. Right, but the problem is I want to tweak the list so that when it sends the server hello out to the client, or when it examines the list, it uses a different list than was configured in um, server ports. It's server selects from the list. No, right. no, and we don't want to offer up a, a we want to take HTTP2 out of the list that we're providing back. Right. So, oops, because for a particular SNI name, the client would say no HTTP2 for that SNI name. But wouldn't you do that by just not selecting HTTP2 as the negotiated protocol? And how do we not select it? That's the problem. Oh, SSL callback for that. Oh, you mean going directly to the SSL stuff? So if we call a uh, sort of SSL select next proto, you use the helper function we use to do that. The overlap. Is it that SSL has a callback? Well, there we go. In the SSL in that region. So I think you can directly, if you put a, pull out the bug in, you can directly find that. Cool. I will let you guys type on that, and we'll continue on until we get out of here. <laughs> So another thing that comes up periodically is client certificate support. Scott has brought that up numerous times. Uh, we still only have one client. Uh, periodically, like in a meeting I was in on Tuesday, someone said, ATS sucks because it only does one client cert. 
Um, so, so far that hasn't really pressed enough that they are in our face saying it sucks. So we haven't done anything yet, but eventually uh, we should probably do that. I know, is, is that becoming a pressing issue for anyone else, or is that? This is for mutual off? Mutual off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're one. You're good. Okay. <laughs> then you'll have an issue. So anyway, uh, uh, you know, it's something that we've kind of talked about, haven't really done anything on. Uh, it seems like ultimately we're going to need. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we'd want to do as a remap config kind of thing. We could do that and just override the global via remap config because this is connecting up to the origin, so we do have time. You could, but it's not really going to do you very much good because you won't be able to authenticate with it. But you don't have the private key. Yeah. You could have them give you your key too. <laughs> have to have a new protocol. One at a time. Yep. <laughs> So anyway, um, as folks are thinking about things, you know, if we think a remap config, re, you know, remap config uh, override would be sufficient, that would probably be an easy enough way to express it. Yeah. Again, yeah, since it's server side, we, we actually have enough time to do that. Client side stuff, we can't do that generally. The cheating that we do now is horrible. We just ask Tom. We have a, a, a plethora of ports that are asked Tom about with the right place of origins. Uh. <laughs> Magic. Yeah, that's just low performance. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, I think uh, I don't know. That, I don't think we have actually a bug on multiple. Did you file a bug on multiple client certs? Yeah. Okay. We should probably reactivate that. <coughs> nice more. See, thanks to Jira, I'll be able to find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was on GitHub, every angry community member could find it. <laughs> All right, another thing that uh, Dave Thompson and I have, Dave Thompson primarily has been working on, um, and I'm probably going to get back to this quarter, is SSL handshake threads. So I think it was maybe two, two summits ago, yeah, a year ago, uh, we talked about the crypto, crypto proxy work that we've been doing, kind of a hack day project. And uh, the idea there is you proxy off the private key operations to another machine. Uh, so that the private key doesn't stay on the ATS box if the ATS box is set up someplace insecure like Albonia. And uh, the crypto proxy is working great. We've got the protocol, that's all working great. However, to get this to work efficiently, the private key operation is performed deep in the bowels of S open SSL. And it blocks, it doesn't come back. And if Normally that's not bad, it's doing computation anyway, so you really can do anything else on that thread. But if you're going 100 milliseconds away, now you have a thread deep in the bowels of OpenSSL, hanging out, not really doing too much for 100 milliseconds, preventing other continuations from doing stuff on the thread. Obviously that's bad. So uh, to try to get that working better, I took a very um, quick and um, broad approach of spawning e-threads for each SSL except call. Um, and Dave, uh, yes? Uh, what is an e-thread? Yeah. E-thread is an internal data structure that uh, wraps our threads. It includes uh, a fair amount of thread local storage for things like the stacks. And the, I think the free lists also have some thread local storage on that. So you are blocking because uh, uh, the OpenSSL engine is running on other box? Right, we're doing, we're making a call to RSA encrypt with private key, and that has been, uh, we're using a crypto engine to change that into communication off to off box. We're waiting for that communication to come. So is it a limitation of the OpenSSL library that you yeah. cannot yield, uh, yes. cannot yield that thread? Yeah. Right, it's not yielding, uh, because yeah. they have because various the yield, does not allow it. They have various yeah. yield points, but that is not one of them. I did look into that. I was very excited by that. It's, it's in 1.1. One, one. Oh, yes, they have async jobs. That sounds great. That's exactly what we want. We want an async job. 
uh, we looked around. I got all excited. They had Dave look at it. Uh, and ultimately, it's a long jump. We can't do that. <laughs> so yeah, I was very bummed. Yeah. So the, yeah, the API doesn't allow you to, to, to build and resume. No. I mean, they have very fixed points where you can do that. And that's not the API is the OpenSSL engine? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if you're using the OpenSSL engine. <laughs> well, yes, we could go put a patch in OpenSSL, which would be rather extensive. So, no, we're not doing that. Um, so I spun in threads, and that kind of worked. And you know, for a little while, it's fine. I think I'm doing, I think I'm memory leaking, actually. It works fine, works great, great. And then the RPS drops. Uh, Dave Thompson picked up, picked, fixed up my original, you know, just create threads willy-nilly and kill them. Uh, so at least there's a pool. It proves things a little bit, but it still would have an order of magnitude drop. So uh, what I plan on doing now is a much narrower async thread, so uh, where we just go into SSL and uh, we do, we spawn a thread off, of, you know, not an e-thread, just a thread, p-thread, that calls the SSL accept, and maybe we have a pool of them, that would be great. And when the SSL accept comes back, we just do a read-ready signal to take us back into the uh, so then we don't have e-threads. We don't have this big memory footprint complex object. And maybe that'll be good enough. Have you thought about just making a socket-based service that's a thread pool that does the encrypt and then talk to it over pipes out of the normal adventure? So talk, you're talking to yourself from one e e pool, you know, your one event loop mm -hmm. to a pool of other event loops and control the parallel that you can that way. So make your own API. Basically, your your, API. Yeah, so you, you, you write to a socket server, which is actually mm -hmm. just a different thread on the other side of the pipe. Mm -hmm. um, and then it does the work and sends it back to you, so you have continuations that look like every other continuation. So that other, the other end of the pipe would be doing the SSL? The other SSL end of the pipe would, would, would do the blocking thing. And, and the, right, it would, basically, it's, a, it's an event pool. Mm -hmm. uh, not an event pool, a thread pool that you can scale that reads from the pipe, does the work, and sends it back. Well, the why not just use the thread pool from the transition variable and a mutex? Like, what's the advantage of that? Because uh, if you use the pipes, then 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 the continuation processes work exactly the same, right? You you write for encrypt, and then you wait for an e or for a read ready, and when the read ready comes back, you have your results. And so you're talking about outsourcing all the SSL operations, or, or just just the block, just that block. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly going through a, a pipe would be a little. Easier. Um, just sits yes. in the framework of the event loop mm -hmm. magically. It still has to have a farm of them out yes. there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You would. So, so yeah. it's not a lot of data. I, I mean, when you're talking about how long it takes here, it's. Not <laughs> in the scheme. That's, that's not the problem. Yeah. OK, well, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. if you really wanted to do high performance one that way, place in memory where you put your work and then you have the on at least on Linux and then or just wake up the other side and signal back and forth. But I'd use pipes so that it yeah. doesn't only work on Linux. Yeah, we just want it to not That's suck very bad going to Albonia. All right. I have not done anything with any of the alternate SSL implementations. Uh, so folks out there, Brian. Uh, have we been looking at boring SSL, Libre SSL, any other new SSLs we should be looking at? How's TLS 1.3 going? I know IETF is coming up, so probably there's not too much. Okay, so it's not time to look at that yet. For 1.3? Oh, okay. Hmm? It's a different API. The, the main issue with boring SSL is it, it does work now, but it's a little too cheap for its own. Oh, and for APS, you mean? Right. It's just that we, we there's an API for it. It's just a different API. Mm. Oh. And there's some more support. We thought it wasn't, but it, <laughs> it is. It's there. Okay. All right, uh, so 
I know, so uh, the last thing is just my last half day project, but before we get on to that, any other kind of uh, SNL, SSL, PLS kind of things that happened recently that we should talk about or folks should be aware of? Can I ask a question, Rebel? Sure. Uh, moving from six to seven mm -hmm. with SSL multi-serve, do we have to do any configuration format changes? That, no. So everything that was there was six is still supported? It's just still there. There's just some new stuff in there. Okay. So the new session optional access to config just supersedes whatever is inside the multi-serve? Mm-hmm. Still use the old one? You can still use the old one. It's pretty equally broken. Actually, first, have you tested that? Maybe we should verify. I don't think it called. It looks like it should just work. Should still be the same logic. If if they just upgrade from sixty to seven and don't put any of the global ticket stuff in, then yeah, so it should be, be the same. Yeah, so this has the grand master key block in it. Well, so my last hack day project mm -hmm. uh, was TPM. So using TPM to store the private key on ATS, so it's kind of like crypto proxy, except easier because it's on the sandbox. Uh, so TPM is trusted platform module. It's this like little secure card thing that's on a lot of motherboards. Uh, so the scenario here is you have a general purpose CPU, it's running ATS, OpenSSL, and it uh, has, OpenSSL uses the crypto engine library to load a TPM engine. There's a cert, and instead of the private key, there is a TSS key blob. And when we get to the point where we need to do an RSA or uh, an RSA private key operation, we use the TSS protocol to talk to the P TPM chip. And it uses something that's coming off the storage root key to decrypt the TS TSS key blob. It performs the private key operation and sends the result back. Uh, still, that has uh, similar performance delay problems, but hey, this is a hack day project. I didn't care. Uh, so you know, the benefit there, you know, it's the same as crypto proxy. That's, uh, all, that's all within chassis. Yeah, yeah, it's all in the same box. It, uh, a difference though with crypto proxy, in this case, like how many private keys can you store in the TPM? Um, well, you can store multiple because the private key is really here. It's just encrypted with your storage root key. But with crypto proxy, basically that. the origin server is the private key. They might want that for their own reasons. And yeah. And yeah, I mean, the, the crypto proxy is more powerful. <laughs> Probably not. I, I will figure it out. Do you have any ideas? There's, I mean, there's these hardware, uh, HW, what's the? HSMs. HSMs, which I mean are similar in spirit, yeah. right? Yeah, well, I was just curious what the points were. You, you get the kind of for free. I, I would, I don't know. Actually, I, used, I just used an emulator, so. <laughs> What was the question? I couldn't hear. Uh, what's the, the how many uh, operations per second can you do on these little TPMs? Oh, uh, it's not is, it's not the equivalent of HSM or even the CPU. Like, is it like one, ten, hundred thousand? Would it keep up with ATS? The, I, last time I looked, at a little one. It was in the like low thousands. Oh. Um, so for a small uh, ATS, that would suffice, yeah. Well, because it's only for uh, new handshake. Yeah, a whole handshake. Mm -hmm. Couple thousand actually. That, yeah. yeah. It might suffice. Right. So, well, and especially if you're going for a remote deployment, you might be okay with having a few more boxes and mm -hmm. more secure. Yeah. And those are just trying to figure out what the ballpark is. Because we did some benchmarking with some of those uh, HSMs and some of the performance of those. Really? Yes. Hmm. Well, you pay a lot of money for them. I think they would be good. Huh? Not like thousands. They're way I don't think the HSMs are for performance. I think they're more for security. Yeah, they've yeah. got all sorts of crazy cards in there for like tamper detection and stuff, but they're not cavium. Yeah, the cavium cards are for more performance, but I guess they don't support DSA or whatever. Then the last one we ended up using like uh, a single core on my desktop, which was faster than entirely ten thousand dollar HSM. All right. Yeah, that's more severe. HSM okay, cards are here. Last time I checked. Sure, and it gets worse if you're not Way in exact worse. key size where mm -hmm. they're, they're built for it. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Presumably, they're EC would be faster. Low hundreds. Maybe. Yeah, the problem is that they really, they really are just like security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're great. They're kind to your VPG. Mm. <laughs> All 
right. Uh, so I used a bunch of tools, uh, so TPM tools to manage your TPM. Um, so in a Linux environment, it was very nice. I used a TPM emulator because it was a hack day thing and getting access to Isolab, that wasn't happening in 24 hours. So TPM emulator, uh, that allowed me to, to test on um, our VMs. Uh, that's the TPM emulator I was using. And uh, I use libengine, uh, libengine <coughs> TPM OpenSSL, so I didn't even have to write the crypto engine, that was great. Uh, so that uh, loaded uh, the TPM logic into our application and had the uh, TSS communication library. So the flow is you load your TPM driver, you initialize the card, you take ownership, that resets the storage key, you create a new TPM key, that makes the TSS key blob, uh, and that can only that key blob can only work with that TPM. So you have a, can't pick it up and move it anywhere. Uh, then we updated ATS. So the code change here is like 16 lines of code. I have the diff over here. So it's pretty small. Uh, so we change, uh, we, we load the TPM engine, and then we use the engine to load the private key. And after that, then everything else works. Works as expected. Oh. So there's the diff. Now in theory, I spent about half my time trying to make, there's an engine config file. So in theory, you should be able to load the engine without any code change. Uh, I gave up after about half a day. It didn't work. Oh. Anyway, there's just a few more lines after that. So it's pretty basic boilerplate kind of code. You know. We're loading our engine. Um, we're initializing our engine. We're loading our private key. That's the, the main part. Pretty minimal code change. And it worked. Um, yeah, it was an emulator, so it wasn't particularly fast. Unfortunately, I only had 16 lines of code change, so I didn't win hack, a hack day. But, uh, but it was fun. Uh, I can I can push the branch. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, or I'll, I'll share the diff, like I said, 16 lines. I've got a TPM you can use, too. You do? Where? It's in the big box. Oh, good. So that will be... Yeah, we have access to TPMs now in production. Yeah, yeah they're pretty, uh, pretty widely <laughs> spread. Most boy aggregator cut in on me. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so that's all I had. <laughs> Any other questions, comments before we hand off to ops folks? All right, Dave, you're up. <laughs> 